don't you just love it when people say, remember when? And then you're able to share some of your stories and tell everyone about the good old days and some of the amazing things that you were a part of. Well, today we're going to remember when Joanne Van Tassel was a part of all these amazing development opportunities in the township, leadership opportunities, volunteer opportunities. We're going to enjoy a program that helps you know Joanne Van Tassel from a unique and new perspective. I'm Penny Schultz. Enjoy Remember When. It is so good to have you here, Joanne. Yep. Thank you for the invitation. I know that you're the first guest on this program, but you've also given me some great ideas for other people that we can interview as time goes on with Remember When. You served as supervisor in Orion Township for three and a half terms, but before you served, you had a long history. Your family had a long history with the community, dating all the way back from the 1940s. Can you tell us a little bit about that time? Well, when I was growing up, right after, as I call it, the war, my folks belonged at Indianwood and played golf. And of course, we couldn't, they couldn't leave three kids at home, so the three kids came along. Myself, a younger sister, and a younger brother. Um, the first year or two, we played in what, at that time, was tennis courts, except there was no net or anything like that, and we just, played around and there were folks who belonged to Indianwood who lived in the area or we'd go over to their houses like uh, the Kings and they lived on Bellevue Island and uh, sometimes we'd go swimming and things like that. We always had a great time but after a couple of years I learned it was more profitable to caddy so I caddied for women. Oh. So I know the old course at Indianwood, you could not lose me on that course if you tried. You could blindfold me, turn me around, drive me out, drop me somewhere, and I'd know exactly where I was and which hole we were on and, and so on. So, uh, no, I always enjoyed that. Uh, when we were members, the Michigan Open was played there. Yes. Uh, Chuck Harbert was a... Uh, a Michigan golfer who won the Open a couple of times, and uh, then later on, um, after my mother hurt her foot, she stopped playing golf, and so we weren't at Indianwood anymore. But uh, when Stan Aldridge came and bought the course and yes. changed things, uh, I was able to tell him a couple of things about what was what and, and so on. And um, The rich history and was able to work both women's opens and uh, then was somewhat involved a little bit in the senior men's uh, open that was held there back in um, 2012. That was pretty exciting. Your mother golfed with my grandmother, Grace Rubelman. That's right. Yeah, your mom was a pretty good golfer, if I've heard the stories yeah. right. Yeah, oh. Indianwood had some special memories for you and your family. Yes. And you also moved to the area. Your mom moved out here. When do you remember when you moved out? January 20th, 1974. And you're on Lake Voorhees? Yes. It's a beautiful home that you have there. Thank you. It's pretty special memories to be able to come and visit and vacation here, but then to live here and move here. You immediately got involved in community service. I have always been involved in politics, as I tell people, it was started in high school, but I became an elected precinct delegate during the first Nixon campaign. Wow. That's 1960 when he ran against JFK. Uh, and being involved, uh, I've been a delegate to more county conventions and state conventions than I can count. I was a delegate to the National Convention in 1980 in Detroit when the Republicans nominated Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I've got more political stories that could take, you know, days to tell, so. Well, before we move on to those, tell us about University of Alabama, what you were involved in there. Um, I went to, in high school, we had something called Radio Workshop, and we broadcast three times a week, a half-hour program, Monday, was for kindergarten through third grade and dealt mostly with fairy tales and nursery rhymes and things like that. Wednesday 
was history and was for fourth through sixth graders. Uh, and we did stories and you know brought history to life. And Friday was science and it was for at that time we called it junior high school. They call it middle school now. Um, but I just loved being involved in that and learning all about stuff that I decided, well, I wanted to go into broadcasting. So I rode away oh. to, I cannot tell you how many schools for their catalog. And at that time, this was before anything was on the internet. The internet didn't exist. So you had to get a printed catalog about that thick and, and go through it. And many of them, many schools, it was either part of the speech department or part of journalism. The University of Alabama, they had a separate school of broadcasting. And I said, that's for me. Perfect for so you. So I went to the University of Alabama. Uh, and as I tell people, I was there between Authorine Lucy and Charlene Hunter, which two different black women who tried to enroll. Uh, Charlene Hunter, no, Authorine Lucy was the first one. And she survived about a half a semester. Um, and then there was, while I was there, there were no uh, black people trying to uh, enter the university. The year after I graduated, with Charlene Hunter and a couple of other people, uh, and this was after George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door and said no. Wow. You know, and uh, you were right in the middle of it. Oh yes, I can remember George mm -hmm. Wallace when he was nothing more than a small country judge um, and, you know, a, a who's he type thing. But uh, then he made that little speech and got notoriety and caused problems. Yeah, so. there were a lot of problems back then. You were involved in history, rich history back then, when the changes were being made. Yes. You played ball too. Tell us a little bit about that. I grew up in a neighborhood of all boys. Um, they were one to four years older than I was. My dad owned the vacant lot next door that had the ball field. And he says, if my daughter wants to play, she gets to play, but no extra strikes, no special rules. She pays the same so we had, when the weather broke, like it has recently, there was a ball game, you know, Monday through Friday, sometimes Saturday, from about nine o'clock in the morning until dark. And the game continued, you know, if one or two guys had to go home for lunch, then we just switched around so there was an equal number. We had special rules. Pitcher's mound was out for first base. If you hit the ball to right field, that was an out. So we could play with about four guys on each side, maybe five people, and keep the game going. And um, I just feel that as the littlest one, the youngest one, I learned an awful lot about ball because of the older players. And I guess that's one of the problems I have with Little League is if you have all six and seven seven year olds playing together, nobody's learning from That's a anybody good point. else. Right. Uh, but when you had that age range that we had, you know, from six till ten or eleven, well then the older kids have got more experience, they know more about the rules and I mean it I just thought it was an ideal situation. So uh by the time I got to high school there was no uh, organized women's sports like there is today. The boys had their sports, you know, it was football, basketball, baseball, and sometimes if you had a swim team, you had a swim team, but nothing for the girls. So I played on the Pontiac Recreation League. So, you know, I played at Bodette Park at Northside, and there was one team, General Motors truck and coach had a ball team. And the GM sponsored it and paid money so they could travel. So I have played as a pickup player for the GM team. No kidding. Going over to Canada and wow. playing over there. So, uh, no, I've played across the state and what had a What position did you play? What? What position? Um, primarily 
third base, but anywhere in the infield I could play. I've played first, I was catcher. Um, this was a fast pitch league, so I was never a pitcher in fast pitch. Uh, but after I got out of college and came back, I uh, played in the Waterford Recreation League team out there. Then that was slow pitch, but again, um, played in uh, mostly the infield. I can remember one year we were scheduled to have a game against the Waterford team, and it was t coached by Butch Traeger, who was a paid volunteer. I mean, not a, he was a paid member of the fire department. And the Waterford Recreation Department provided him a schedule that he, they didn't schedule any games for his team if he was scheduled to work that day. I mean, it was a sweetheart deal, that fine. That was a good deal. But he had one of the better teams, and I can remember we were practicing before the game, and, the, and a guy who was coach put me out in the outfield. They hit a fly ball to me. Now, I wasn't real good on depth perception, but I caught the ball and immediately threw it into second base and hit the bag right on the mark. I mean, right here, just where it's supposed to be. He saw that, and he told his players, don't hit the ball to left field. Oh, boy. There was, at that <laughs> game, there was not one <laughs> single ball hit to left field. Great. We faked them out. I mean, I was lucky if they'd known how bad I was in the health field. <laughs> but, uh, so. I love it. Did you play with any of the women professionals back then? Um, when I was in the Pontiac League fast pitch, there were a couple of gals on our team who had played in the women's professional league. The one that was in the movie, you know, A League of Their Own. Um, now, they were... I mean, they were probably in their 40s by this time. I mean, so they were not uh, super duper, uh, but they still knew the game. They still could hit as well as anybody else. And um, you but, helped shape um, history for women athletes. Then, no, yeah. I'm impressed. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, you're still pretty healthy today. You stay strong. I'm glad for that, Joanne. If I had better knees, I'd still play. If they had a church league where they had, you know, men and women on the same team, yeah, I would still play, but no, the knees won't allow it. Well, you got other things you moved into. I'm really glad yeah. you did that. So you were our supervisor for three and a half terms in Orion Township. Tell us how that got started. I moved here in 74. That was the year that Oakland County elected the first county executive. Because I grew up in Pontiac and at one time lived within a mile of Dan Murphy, who was chairman of the Board of Auditors, and Lynn Allen, who was clerk. Um, you know, I knew them. I got Dan to come out here and go door to door in one precinct, my precinct. It's the only precinct he carried. When I moved here, this township was 100% Democrat. They had the whole township board. You didn't get a job at Orion Township, you didn't get appointed to a planning commission or the Board of Appeals or anything unless you were a member of the Democrat Club. Um, okay, fine. Um, the county commissioner was a Democrat. Uh, I got Dan to come here because I was active politically, knew other people. I spoke at coffee hours and things like that on behalf of the Republican Party. So, they, that fall, they put me up to be uh, representing my sub on the homeowners board. Mm -hmm. So we meet in January and had a lot of good people. Nobody wanted to be vice president. I'd be vice president. Sure. So my task was to work on getting Walden Road paved between Baldwin and Joslin. Thank you. Um, one of the, uh, the wives of one of the members camped out at Township Hall, which was up in the Quonset Hut, which oh, yes. is now part of Jacobson's. Yep. And would sit there, they have to go in, well, we're working on it with, you know, you didn't have FOIA then. Um, but uh, I worked at the county in data processing. I knew Hugh Haney, the county treasurer on a first name basis. and. Uh, 
at that time you still had the tax allocation board where townships had to submit a budget to the county so they could determine how the 50 mil limit would split up, how much could go to the schools and how much to the townships and so on. So each township had to submit a budget. He gave me a copy of the Orion Township budget. It showed $414,000 in the township's fund balance. Now, our homeowners association had gone, I think, and Bill Haydell was supervisor, and he made the mistake of saying, well, if you find money in the budget, we'll do it. The township share was $125,000. Well, I found it. and I Good figured, challenge. Um, <laughs> well, maybe there's something I'm not understanding, but they've got uh, somebody on our homeowners board knew somebody at Plant Moran, and they looked at it, and they said, no, these are legitimate numbers and so on. Um, and so we went to the township and we said we found the money and they didn't do anything about it and so I said I'm going to run for trustee on getting the road paved. We had Bob Sherrity who ran as supervisor and a couple of other people ran. Well Bob and I got elected. We went door to door. Right. We That's the way to do it. Knocked on every, you know, um, we didn't do apartments, but uh, we got elected and uh, we ended up getting Walden Road paved. I had a contractor in town who warned me about the contractor who got the job, who will remain nameless. Okay. Who said, but watch him because he's known for cheating. Well, each morning I'd take the dog and we'd go down and we'd walk down Walden Road. Well, the inspectors weren't there, but they were supposed to dig out all of the muck in the area where the canal comes real close to the road, right between there and the Keatington condos. It is very close. And he was starting to put good fill in before getting all the muck. Well, I called the road commission. Good for you. They came, the inspector came, they caught him. Good. You know, hands down guilty. He had to dig out and throw away all that good fill mm -hmm. because it had been contaminated. Sure. Had to muck out all the marl that was there. And um, so that road was done, I'm going to say, in 78 or 79 and has held up. It sure has. Better than some of the other roads, but no, I kept... An you keep an on. eye on things. You're known for doing your homework. That's right. And you keep an eye on things. I love that about you. And the community has benefited greatly for generations. Yep. Pretty remarkable, Joanne. Yep. So you served a partial term also. How did that come about as supervisor? Well, well, I was elected three times as supervisor from 80 to 92. In 92, there was an election I lost the primary because people in my subdivision wanted to have one garbage hauler for the whole sub. They thought I was against it. They never came and talked to me. They never said word one. Mm. They supported somebody else. Uh, and he was supported by a couple of people at the township who will remain nameless. Um, but he won by about 60 votes. Okay. Not much. Fine. And, uh, so I went and got a real estate license and did other things from 92 to 98. 98, I ran as super as trustee. Yeah, I remember that. And um, got elected. I probably served a year and a half or so and was called when the village manager who had been there a year up and quit. Uh, I mean, she came to a meeting and said, now, here's my two weeks notice, oh, bye. That's, that's pretty uh, quick. So I w was brought in as an interim and eventually hired full time and stayed in the village for eight years. And, but that's a whole other story. You kept a um, great eye on things during that eight year period too. And I know there were a lot of procedures put in place then too. Well, the biggest, pro the, the project I had was handed 
was a water main and road improvement project that had started under John Birchtold. Mm -hmm. The gal who came in after he uh, took a position in another community, like I say, was there for a year and um, didn't do much. I came in and uh, the first thing I did was whenever there was any improvements to be made and the contractor was going to work in this particular, let's say Bellevue uh, Island area, I would call a meeting of all the people that lived in the area. What concerns do you have about the road, about the water, and so on, and get it all resolved? I had, we did it at about 5 6 o'clock at night so people could be home from work. I had the contractor there. I was there, but people had a chance to ask their questions, to get answers, to know what was going on, and things went a lot smoother because of it, and we avoided a lot of problems. The one problem that was made, you know, it was before I, you know, inherited the job, Sure. was they gave the paving job to Thompson McCulley, which was the biggest road paver here in this part of the state. There was also doing a project on M59 from Waterford West. Well, now whose job is gonna get done? first. Waterford. MDOT job on M59 yeah. or the Village of Lake Orient on Bellevue Island. Yeah. So there were times when things were I mean, we had stuff scheduled out on Central on the Swiss Village area mm -hmm. that got held up because Thompson McCulley, MDOT says, well, we're ready to do here, you know, and fine. Uh, there's you no were way at their I'm mercy. going to beat MDOT. So. Yeah. You were definitely at their mercy. You got water out here too. You were pretty involved in that. Well, the water was so rusty. Tell us when that took place. I didn't get water. GM got okay. water. I was right. involved when GM came down. I was still mm -hmm. a trustee. Yeah. I was running for supervisor because Bob Charity said he wasn't gonna run anymore and his wife didn't want him running in the first place, but that's another story. Um, and what happened, GM did some testing and they said if they drilled wells to supply water to the three cooling towers they were building, that it would draw down the water table so far that anybody in the, the vicinity who was relying on well water would soon find they had a dry well. Mm. And GM says, we don't want to get involved in that. We want you to bring Detroit water here. So Detroit water came up through Auburn Hills, came up Giddings Road, and the main attachment was on the north side of Brown Road, opposite where Giddings comes in there. Um, and that worked fine. Well, the engineers, uh, which was OHM at the time and have been here ever since, thank goodness for that. Absolutely. Um, they said, well, we can take a line down Brown Road out to 24 and run a 16-inch line of both sides of 24. They didn't want to have a case, well, let's put the mm -hmm. water line on the west side. Somebody on the east side, well, now you got to dig under 24. Tear it up. No, we're not playing that game. Good. We'll dig under 24 once to get the water up. And so 16-inch line went up both sides of 24. So we brought the water up 24 from Brown Road to just across Silverville to serve the industrial area. And we paid for it by establishing a special assessment district. Good. And all the people said, well, you know, the landowners, why should we pay? I will tell you what. We will give you dollar for dollar credit on capital and lateral charges for every dollar that you pay in special assessment. Well, the guys looked at it. Oh, all we're doing is paying capital and lateral charges early. No problem. We'll go for it. So uh, we got that taken care of. A couple of years later, I, requests came from people who own property on up the road and from the, some of the subdivisions about uh, extending it further. Or so we did it. By that time, GM had paid into capital and lateral charges and 
they made the mistake of saying, charge us exactly what everybody else is paying. We never raised the rates for GM. We charged them exactly the same. But we ended up with so much money that we could then afford to bond the project, paying for it out of what we had gotten from GM. So the water went all the way up 24 to, um, I think, uh, almost to Odana. We um, served the apartments that was built on Buckhorn Lake um, there, Orient which Cove. was new. But the existing subdivisions in the John Winter Land and Home subdivision, which ran from Clarkston Road up to um, the village line. So you're talking Glanworth, Summer, Golden Gate, Markdale, Parkview. They were on the village water system. Mm -hmm. And the village wasn't willing to release them so they could be on the townships. So, you know, and they're still on the village system. But that's, you know, another well, That was story. their decision. But, uh, Richard in White? addition to oh. coming up 24, The Juda Lake subdivision and the Keatington subdivisions were on municipal well systems. And in this part of the township, they got high iron content. Yes. So the water had a high iron content. And so you could tell when people sprinkled their lawn or where it hit the house, oh, here's this orange stripe across the side of the the building yeah. and uh, and it did create sometimes problems with the color of laundry and things especially oh, white yeah. stuff and <laughs> um, the engineers said we can just you know bring that Detroit water up come up uh, the relocated gettings get it over to Joslin and we can serve these subdivisions and so that's what we did and it's allowed the township to expand the water system where needed to build a water tower so we can fill the water tower yeah. at night when the rates are lower so smart. and have it available during the day. I mean, so there was a lot of good that came out of GM coming to town. And you were ready to tackle all of those challenges. Thank you. Remember when you hired Dick White? Wasn't he a part of a CEDA no, program? Dick White was hired before I was. He was hired when Haydell was supervisor. Okay. He was part of a CETA program, wasn't he? I think so, yes. Yeah, boy, was he good. Yes. He really had vision. Um, he knew what he wanted for the community, and he loved the community, so he did a yes. fantastic job. I miss him. He's so a great guy. Um, so remember when you connected people together to get this Orion Center, and you brought ONTV, the Cable Commission, to the table? Okay, Let's talk wait, about that, that. Okay, first of all, I don't take credit for stuff that somebody else does. All right, did. let's talk about it. Okay, Matt Gibb is supervisor. Mm -hmm. The senior center, such as it was, was located up where the village hall now is. Okay, and they were in the lower level. Lisa Sokol was the director. Yes. And Matt saw the need for a new community center, it served the whole community, have meeting rooms, uh, be able to rent space out and people could have... With a cottage feel. With what? With a cottage feel, lake feel. He wanted yeah. it to be well, like that, a lake. That's, that's another story. <laughs> um, <laughs> the idea was people could have wedding receptions, baby mm -hmm. showers, wedding sho you know, that type of thing. So we had planned for a commercial kitchen. In order to have enough <coughs> Excuse me, money. Matt needed to find some other source of revenue. Well, at the time, the Cable Commission was looking for a new. They, they when Cable came to town as United and later Tribune United and eventually Comcast, the law was such that they had to have a franchise fee. Orion was late in talking about cable and stuff like that. The communities south of us, Auburn Hills, Rochester Hills, Troy, Royal Oak, so other communities down in that southeast corner had banded together to have cable come in. 
we were too late to join. So we had to negotiate on our own. The franchise fee um, and the franchise agreement called for them, the cable coming to provide a space, some minimal equipment, um, and so on. And then the cable commission had to use the franchise fee to do it. The cable company provided one person. Um, and we were in that shopping center um, back between um, Tim Hortons on one side and Taco Bell on the other. Those, they didn't exist, you know, anyways. Um, and the Cable Commission was good at watching their pennies and were able to um, save money over time. Well, we had to have an ordinance at the. So Beth Damala, who was council president in the village, and I said, the franchise franchise fees are going to go for it. public access only. We're not going to use them to buy a new police car, to hire a new fireman, to you know, or something like that. A lot of communities did it and suffered, but that's another story. Um, so the franchise fee continues. It. Then the state changed the law, and a cable company nobody had to pay for as much of this stuff. So now the cable commission took over more responsibility. They began looking for a new location where they could have a better studio. Uh, we investigated. I mean, I got them appraisals on property on Clarkston Road, mm -hmm. a couple of possibilities. Uh, we looked at other existing buildings and finally Matt's looking for money and I said wait a minute there you go why don't we you know make mm -hmm. Orion TV I mean the cable commission part of your building here I mean it's central and the cable commission liked the idea and so I negotiated the deal now if a, a sharp attorney had been paying attention, they said, well, wait a minute, you can't sit on both sides. You can't sit as a member as a trustee and sit as a member of the Cable Commission and negotiate both sides. Unless you're Joanne Van Tassel. <laughs> and I said, watch. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> so I made sure that the agreement for you the Cable fair. Commission said we would pay, I think, a third down or whatever when the deal is signed. Yep we would pay another third at a certain point, but we wouldn't pay the last amount until we got a certificate of occupancy. Mm -hmm. And I made sure that the cable commission owned that piece Love it. of the building of the land of whatever that it was paying for. I was on the board at that time with you. So I and, remember that, um, it was so good. It's why so we're here. So that's why we have this facility here. Yep. Um, we've had good people serve on the Cable Commission going way back to the first with Bud Baber and Doug Corliss, uh, who made sure we were looking at the right type of equipment if we had to buy it and mm -hmm. so on. They bought extensive knowledge, you know. I wouldn't have known the difference between A and B. I mean, but they mm -hmm. did and yep. uh, so we've been very fortunate as a township, but by saying the franchise fee goes to public access, and we ended up, because when we, we have three public access channels in effect, mm -hmm. it's called PEG, Public Education Government. So Orient Township and the village between them have one cable channel. The Lake Orion School District has a separate, and public access has a third separate channel. Unfortunately, when AT&T came to town, everything's all together, and there's one channel that you go to, and you can pick what community you want and what, you know, but... Uh, it's still funded the same way. Yep. Yeah, that was so. fantastic, Joanne. I'm glad that you were able to help negotiate that. We needed that. We need someone who had yep. the wisdom from both sides to present it. Yeah, this is a pretty mm -hmm. cool place. Orient Center has been amazing for a lot of yep. people for a long time. Yes. I'm glad Matt Gibb was able to see that, and then he brought partners in. 
And when smart. we came to the groundbreaking for this, and we had a, a big celebration because there was a groundbreaking on the water tower, which was already under construction, it was this building, and I forget what the third thing was. The architect was Jim Cummins. Mm -hmm. And he had not been to the site. He was just told what kind of stuff. Originally, the Cable Commission the, was on that side of the Wildwood. building. Wildwood. And the kitchen and the meeting rooms and stuff was all over here. And the dumpster was over mm -hmm. here. He came and said, Flip it. Oh, look at that lake out there. Because the, the groundbreaking, I think, was done in November or something. Mm -hmm. Anyways, so they flipped the site. But they didn't move the dumpster. Oh, they did move the dumpster. That's right. The we dumpster should have left it out. over here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they did. But um, so it that's was Wildwood. How, it what? was it, the third one was Wildwood. We had a lot of shovels in the ground at that time. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. The dedication of Van Tassel Bridge, that was very special. Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, you were surprised. You, you, you credit Chris. Chris Barnett. Yes. Now, I had served four years as a trustee, so I knew what was going on in the township and was somewhat prepared. Plus, I had been involved in the city of Pontiac and had some experience from there. Um, I ran for re-election in 2012 and lost in the primary to Chris Barnett. He was coming in with no experience, hadn't served on the planning commission, hadn't served on the township board, hadn't served anything. And I said, there's no sense him coming in and not knowing which end is up. So I made sure uh, we were negotiating with Sherry at times over Heron Spring. Mm -hmm. I included him in those meetings. I made sure he went to OCAT's business, the Oakland County's Township Supervisors Association. So he began to know the people he'd be dealing with, know some other supervisors he could, you know, Network. ask questions of and things like that. So. Um, I've always had a good working relationship with Chris, and uh, he, over time, had said, you know, and didn't ask me about it, didn't say, you know, he just, in his mind, you know, for all that she's done, mm -hmm. she needs to have her name on something. He's out with Jim Stevens from OHM, the Township Engineers, as they are building the... Um, wooden bridge to connect the paint tree the paint creek trail with Clarkston Road to get them over to the Pollyann Trail. And they've got this bridge coming. And they are unloading as I get the story from Chris, this bridge and as they've got the crane you know, all of a sudden Chris says, We're gonna name that the Van Tassel Bridge. Beautiful. And that's how it came about and they had a nice dedication ceremony and everything and uh, it was pretty special so i'm thank you. glad chris honored you that way yes. that's fantastic yep. joanne um so that you're involved I, you know you're not serving in the government part anymore but you're involved with the oh lake. yes i am oh, oh, I, tell me, tell i'm me. secretary of the cia the yes you no. are and you're alternate on the board of review that's right that's right okay so i take that back but you're also serving in other areas, our Veterans Memorial, our Lake Orion Lions. Let's talk about some of those things that you're involved in that you okay. really treasure. I was supervisor at the time, serving on the chamber board. When Dr. Master Mateo comes up with an idea of a war memorial, as he called it, if you check the records, the official name is the Orion War Memorial. And it was later, through public use, called the Veterans Memorial. Mm -hmm. And so that's the known name. That's not the official name. Um, but I served on 
the war with Joe, and the chamber agreed that that was something they needed to be involved with. And so originally, there were veterans on the board. There were two members from the chamber, and then there were some citizens at large. Um, and then they had to look for a site. Well, in the meantime, and this would have been, um, I'm going to say in 93, 94, M24 was widened from four lanes to five lanes. They took some of the widening out of the west side of the road. So there was a business at the corner of Odana and 24 called Lumberjack Builders. Because of the amount of property that the state took for that fifth lane, it, the site wasn't big enough for Lumberjack to be able to meet setbacks and parking and all the others. So it just sat vacant. Um, and the township ended up going to MDOT and buying the property. This was when Colette Dwozik was supervisor. And um, they signed an agreement. Um, I was unaware of it until I started doing research regarding, well, what kind of an agreement does the Veterans Memorial have with the township regarding where the monument? And I read all the way. Do you know what the last paragraph of that agreement said? After 30 years, the township will acquire everything here at the Veterans Memorial. Oh. And, here's, and I says, wait a minute. Um, and brought that to some people's attention. Now, in the meantime, the township, the Veterans Memorial, Dr. Messman, had been interested in acquiring the property immediately to the north, where that incredible edibles, or whatever it is, is. And um, the agreement also called for this township supervisor and one of the trustees to serve on the uh, Veterans Memorial Board. And so Chris came up with the, well, let's have the township buy the property and over time sell it to the Veterans Memorial. And they came up with an agreement and uh, I got a copy and I read it and I had some concerns and I spoke up and uh, that we had to renegotiate. And, then, and as long as we're talking about, let's talk about the old one, about the township acquiring this in 30 years. I said, you know, we're now in the 28th year. Goes by fast. And um, so with Dan Kelly, the township attorneys, I, you know, they said, okay, Dan, you go negotiate with Van Tassel. Right. And uh, Who has we'll, done her homework. And we'll come. so what we ended up with is over time, as the lease runs out, because the f fellow who sold the property n insisted that the township, if they acquire the property, honor the man's lease. Okay. With the edible arrangements. Yep. Okay. And so the agreement that we now have, the township owns the land where the memorial is. They own the land where the business is. The Veterans Memorial owns everything there at the Veterans Memorial, including the, uh, the water lines and the drainage lines that are underneath the ground that you can't see and all the stuff that you can see. And when the lease uh, runs out, we'll own the building next door. And, and in order to make the deal, the Veterans Memorial paid $25,000. Mm -hmm. uh, towards the down payment. So um, that's where things stand now. But that's, um, I mean, and you, when you go back and look at the names of the people who signed that agreement, shame on every single one of them mm -hmm. for not realizing what it years. called for, or thought 30 years is so far away sure that it'll isn't. never happen. Well, mm -mm. time flies. It goes yeah. by so fast. So. Um, I was involved initially, was not involved for a while, mainly when I was with the village, and have been involved for a number of years. I can't tell you how far back. I mean, at, at least 
10 to 12 years because I was doing minutes and I can go back to the date of the minutes and they date back to 2012, 2013, 2014. So, I mean, there's 10, a, 10, 12 years there. Right, it's been a long time. So, You're involved with the Lake Orion Lions too. Yes, I was involved with the Lake Orion Lions on an unofficial basis when I was supervisor. And then um, they had a Citizen of the Year award that they gave out and they had a big tent downtown and put on a nice program. If you really wanted to hear a storyteller, you, you should have heard Bill O'Brien, who owned a little party store right there where the American Legion is now. And um, anyways, uh, they had a beer tent down in the Children's Park parking lot. And I would go and sell tickets. I easily sold all by myself over $1,000 worth of tickets. But I would go and volunteer that. I was not a member. At that time, they didn't have women members in the Lions Club. That's something of a more recent vintage. But I always felt as village manager or as township supervisor, or as a trustee, my first responsibility is to the citizens of the town. And so I wasn't, you know, the Lions Club meets the same time the Planning Commission meets. And so, no, my responsibility is to the citizens first. But after I was out of office, I mean, I lost the primary and joined the Lions Club. Yes. And that was Stayed in 2012. Engaged. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and have been active um, there in various roles, helping in their various fundraisers and so on. So, you're involved with elections too. You're one of our election workers. That's right. And I can go way back as an election worker in the city of Pontiac when they were far more trusting. I mean, my precinct where I lived, I lived near General Hospital, and our voting precinct was at the hospital. And we had the ladies who ran it. This is with the old voting machine. I mean, the, the lever the machine. The lever you ones. Big, <laughs> big, you know, you yeah. push the, you know. Um, and I volunteered to take the results, you know, and all, whatever needed to go down to City Hall. I volunteered to, they were perfectly happy to have me take it because they could all go home. I mean, they'd been there since six o'clock in the morning. It's now 10 o'clock or after. I would volunteer to take that so I could see what else was going on and checked results. I mean, I am one who can read election results and know which direction things are going, so. Yeah, uh, you are pretty sharp at just about everything you set your hand to. Yeah. Joanne, this has been amazing to hear your history and remember when and learn some of the things I didn't even know about but the community is learning things about you they didn't know about so I just want to say thank you so much for giving us this opportunity I hope you enjoyed yourself do we have a couple of more minutes oh we sure do okay people have often asked me in your time of us what are you most proud of hmm. And I amazed a neighbor of mine when without taking a breath, I said, keeping the state prison out of Orion Township. Wow, yes. To me, that was the biggest thing. I mean, getting GM in here is one thing. Uh, yeah, approving subdivisions and other stuff like that is, but keeping that prison out of here. And as a result, I mean, the people from the state, they, were, they had a two-person committee. They came and met and said, uh, we're gonna build a prison and it's gonna be over here. Um, By the school. It was at the southwest corner of Scripps and 24. That was part of the property that yep. was acquired by the state as part of the Chrysler bailout in 1980 with a provision that this land be used in perpetuity, meaning forever, for outdoor recreation. Uh, well, I wasn't about to let that go on. I went and studied the law that the state had passed, saying the criteria for citing a prison and so on, and put together a presentation using an aerial photograph of 
the area. And what I did is I had a nice big one drawn up and I had eight and a half by 11 ones drawn that I made a packet for every member on the uh, Corrections Commission. Sent it in a week ahead of the meeting thinking they would send it out and if, no, the Corrections Commission people never handed it out until the, the night of the meeting. Okay, fine. But in doing the presentation, I, I didn't play the NIMBY game, the not in my backyard. Right. Uh, as I tell people, there's something in the water up in the Lansing area that any time any official from a local unit of government complains about what the state wants to do in their area, because the state knows better, I said, they always accuse you of playing the NIMBY game, the not in my backyard. They said, we didn't play that game. We never mentioned it. I just took their criteria and made the presentation. And I said, uh, oh, did the state selection committee, did they tell you about the elementary school across the street? Oh, and that there's a junior high school right there. And if there's a high school right there, because at that time, what's now the Cirque building was the high school. Mm -hmm. Oh, did they tell you that there's a large subdivision right across the east side of 24th? Oh, did they tell you about the subdivision on the north side of Scripps Road? Oh, did they tell you about the two churches there? I mean, the people on the Corrections Commission are now dumbfounded because they've got this aerial that identifies all these Things. They see why the site is so unacceptable that the Cable Commission, the, the state corrections people, couldn't get the commission to vote to approve that site. Well, as long as it wasn't approved, they couldn't go to the feds, the Department of the Interior, which had control of the site, to get it released for a well, because of the presentation, I was using the time to contact Congressman Broomfield, which I, who I knew from the time I was in Pontiac, getting he and his staff to talk to the Department of the Interior not to release the site, that it was supposed to be used for outdoor recreation and we needed the outdoor recreation, da 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 And because Reagan is president, Broomfield's a Republican. The people in the Department of the Interior, you know, decision making are Pointed. Republican. Then we were able to get the Department of the Interior not to release the site. Amazing. Then, as a follow up, I was asked that year to be a speaker on a panel regarding locating unlanded, unwanted land uses. And it dealt strictly with the prison issue. They had me saying no. They had a friend of mine from the MTA board who was clerk up in Kinross Township. They wanted the prison because they'd lost the Kinross Air Force Base. They wanted the prison for the job. And then the third person was one of the members of this, on the committee to locate prison sites. So I get up there and I take a light-hearted approach toward it. And I said, well, the first thing you got to remember, there's something in the water in Lansing about NIMBY. Don't pay any attention to it. That's something that, like I say, they drink that water and it gets in their head. So just don't pay any attention to it. It's a <laughs> right. bunch of nonsense. I said, next thing you need to know is don't shoot till you see the white of their eyes. Just because they come to town and say, we're going to build this here, this prison or some other unwanted land use. You just keep your mouth shut. You just listen. You do your homework. You wait until, you know, they're over committed. And then you make your presentation and shoot holes in what they've got. And there were a couple of others, but the one I ended up with, and, and the last thing, and remember, this is the most important, never show your whole card. I mean, so if you've ever played poker, you know what I'm talking about. The state had no idea what else I knew or what else I could bring to bear in this thing. That after this, the southwest corner of Scripps and 24 was turned down, they had other people in the township bringing, well, here's this project, 
property here, like up in the Heather Lake area, which wasn't developed at the time. Or, or uh, the state would listen to anything Good. involving Orion Township. And I figured it's because that fellow on the committee heard my presentation right. and didn't know what else this little lady had. Exactly. That, so we don't have a prison, and yes, uh, and as I've told a couple of people, <laughs> oh man, I should have gotten an award from yes. the state for saving them millions of dollars. Absolutely, for not having to build a prison. So we, there is no prison, hooray, in Oakland County. So, but man, thank you, Joanne. That would have changed everything. So yeah, so there's a nice subdivision there mm -hmm. now, and there's a kindy, kinder care, you know, daycare center there, and there's other. Uh, development that's coming so um, well done well you. done you uh, we got to keep going for a minute incinerator just briefly tell us what happened with that I know there was a point where they wanted to put an incinerator in this area the incinerator was the state had mandated every single county or combination of counties if they wanted to band together, especially up in the northern part of the state, to develop a solid waste disposal plan as to where, how much trash is being generated in your county and how are you going to dispose of it and where is it going to be located. Um, we'd already had Jack Weber, when we kept a landfill out as long mm -hmm. as the Little Oakland Orient Airport was there. But when that land was sold to GM for the GM plant, then the airport went away. And Jack Weber was real quick to race up to Lansing and talk to his friend at the solid waste thing to, you know, license his 24 or 28 acres. Uh, so he got that without following the state law. The state didn't follow the law. Weber, if I don't have to follow the state law, that's fine. Just give me a license. And uh, so when that came about, I was able to get in the county plan a provision that it wouldn't be expanded without the approval of the township. And I served on the county solid waste board for years, going to meeting after meeting and listening to all that nonsense. Um, just to make sure that this was taken care of. The incinerator was originally proposed to be in Waterford near Dixie and Telegraph, which, crazy idea. In order to convince local officials, and that they'd hired this company, it's a team of lawyers out of Washington, D.C., to kind of guide things. This is the doing, the county commission went along with it because the two staff people working in, out of the drain commissioner's office at that time, but really as part of public works, had said, well, don't worry, whatever we do, uh, the townships are gonna pay for it. Well, no, townships aren't, but the, the county commissioner, without doing their homework and checking with us, you know, what were we, you know, they bought it, so they figured, well, we'll pay the money, but it'll all get paid back to us. They took representatives from communities, Orient had a landfill, um, in fact, more than one, tell you the truth. Uh, the city of Pontiac was involved, people from Waterford were involved, there were a couple of others. We took us on a tour. We went down to Florida, to the Tampa Bay area, which had an incinerator and uh, St. Petersburg are right, you know, side by jowl. And uh, so we looked at what they had. We went to Nashville, which had an incinerator, and went to Baltimore, which had an incinerator, to see what was what and how things were being handled. And um, so learned an awful lot there. But no, the county when the incinerator plans just blew up. I mean, it got to the point, the guys from Washington, the attorneys were talking about, we're not gonna dispose of so much as a 
you know, a nose tissue in our landfills because we're going to incinerate everything. Ooh. Well, they were already having troubles down in Detroit with the incinerator that they just tore down uh, a yeah. few months ago. Um, but they said, well, we've got to come up with a landfill. And so they were looking to expand the landfill. In the meantime, Waste Management had bought out Weber. And, uh, and of course, they've got more money than they know what to do with. So they could afford uh, to lobby and, and so on, where Weber wasn't financially able to do the same sort of thing. Right. But they did finally authorize um, increasing the permitted area for the landfill there on uh, Silver Bell, but Orion Township out of it got water and sewer extended to the people on Giddings and on Walden Road at free charge, mm -hmm. got Walden Road paved from Joslin to 24, got Giddings paved, Yes. Um, also got the people on Silver Bell and Nancy G, um, Silver Valley, um, got them water and sewer also so we got the township plus we got a a disposal fee that came oh, to the, the township fee? yep we're um, so, doing a lot of great things with those funds so we negotiated a good deal and um yeah so well i'm glad i'm glad you were able to stay engaged in that and didn't just let it happen that's really what marks you joanne is yeah. you are out there doing what needs to be done every single time when there was a yeah. tough decision you were doing your homework i gotta ask you but we'll, we'll wrap up and i'll get you on here again if i can but what does a week look like for you and i know some of it but if you were going to tell our viewers what's an average week for you i know you're always engaged and you're doing well, enjoyable things but you're still involved with the community first of all the week starts with sunday and church yes um, and there are times when I feel, oh, I don't feel, I don't want to, hmm. wait a minute. When Christ was here walking the land, he didn't say, well, my feet hurt, and so I'm not going to go over here to Galilee, you know, or Bethsaida. Uh, I said, wait a minute. He never said no. If I really believe as a Christian, then I have got to be in church, I have got to be active. So I am active with my church, which is First Presbyterian in downtown Pontiac, and we are continuing the celebration of our 200th anniversary. Wow. And we have been in that location for about 150 Congratulations. years. Congratulations. So, um, so that's been a lot of fun. Then it depends on the week. Right now, I generally don't have a meeting on Monday, but the third Tuesday is session meeting the church's governing board. The first and third Wednesdays is Lions Club. The second Wednesday is the local Republican club. Um, the second Wednesday in the middle of the day is Orient Veterans Memorial. Um, and I do the newsletter for the Lions Club, so that's, you know, getting it done whenever I can get it done. And, um, and I usually take Friday and Saturday uh, always something, but I am not the kind that can sit still, and I, I represent right now both the Lions Club and the Veterans Memorial on the chamber uh, membership thing. I'm not on their board, but uh, I'm the one that all the communications come through. And uh, so just, and it's from time to time they have ribbon cuttings and that's usually on Thursdays and uh, other classes and things like that. So. Well, thank you, Joanne, for always being willing 
for your intelligence, for the wisdom and the time, and just for loving the community well and serving so well. Okay, one of the other things I did that we didn't, regarding the Lions Club, uh, I am a reader. And I like to encourage people to read. And until the Democrats remove the requirement for a child to be able to read at the third grade level when they're in third grade, that used to be the law here. And I like to see Lake Orion schools do well. So I got the Lions Club to donate money to buy a book that the person, you know, that the student could have, their very own. They get to pick out, we got all kinds of, you pick out which one you want. Oh. And it's your book. Yeah. And it was for first and second, no, kindergartners and first graders at Carpenter and at Blanche Sims. And I just hope that those kids, you know, Take it to heart. I, I remember one little boy, he was so excited. What book mm. did you get? I got a book all about frogs and I like frogs. And you see this here? And the, and he he was tickled pink. I mean, I couldn't have given him $1,000 and made him happier. I mean, he was, he had a book about frogs and, you know, other ones had cars, books about cars or books about this person or mm -hmm. astronauts. I mean. But they were just super happy to have this book that was all their own that they could have and they could take home. And and I just like to do that. I mean, when Pine, no, it was Stadium, was changing over their library and they had a whole mm -hmm. library of older books to give away. I took them down two separate occasions. The first year I took them down to my church, First Presbyterian, which was also tutoring at Owen Elementary in Pontiac. So the books were to be given through the church to the second year I had. It. We still had so many books at the church, they didn't want the books. I ended up taking them over to Grace Centers of Hope. What a gift. For they were thrilled. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had that back end of my car and the front seat so packed with yes. books. There wasn't a room, you know, I couldn't have put a, bur a bird in and had room for the bird. That's <laughs> how much. And, uh. But they were happy to have it. Fine, let kids have books. Give them two or three. I mean, I've had mm -hmm. books since the time I was little. And I've got a library of my own that I think would rival anybody's. That, uh, That's amazing. I'm not surprised. Do you know we started this conversation talking about students and kids and getting them educated yep. when you were there at the university and here we are wrapping up with that same type of heart yep. for students. Joanne, I so appreciate you. I am so thankful. Will you come back and share more? I if know invited. you're going to be busy. <laughs> you're invited <laughs> for sure. Oh, I appreciate you immensely. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I hope you enjoyed this too. Yes, I did. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Remember when. I'm glad you were here. I hope you enjoyed everything. We sure did. Have a great day.